Hey everyone, I'm Kiara Ember, and today I will be talking to you about delicious draconic dishes, meat alternatives. So I'll give you a quick intro about myself. Um, like I said, I'm Kiara Ember. You can also call me just Kiara K or Obligatory Coffee if you really want to do that. That's my username over on Tumblr and a number of other places. Um, I'm a Western Dragon Otherkin or Theriumith, um, however you want to call me. Um, I'm also Andalite, uh, Cheetah, and Domestic Cat Hearted, uh, and I've been present in the online community since around 2009, And but I've uh, felt ultra-human to some extent since uh, probably the early 1990s. Um, some of my food background, I've worked as a chef or in general food service for around seven years. I'm a little bit out of practice, but I still uh, love cooking and baking. They're some of my favorite hobbies. Um, I really like unusual foods and unique recipes, and I like experimenting in the in the kitchen whether uh, things come out well or not. That's, you know, always to be determined, um, but I have a lot of fun with it. And I used to be a vegetarian. Um, I've considered going vegan, but now I call myself a flexitarian, or essentially, you know, I will eat some meat. Um, basically, if it's given to me, um, or it's it's already bought, I'll eat it, but I try not to buy my own meat. Um, or, you know, animal products generally. Um, but if it's in front of me, I'll eat it. Um, I do want to, you know, say a disclaimer. Um, everything I'm presenting here follows U.S. food safety guidelines, um, and I've been cer food safety certified in the past through my work. Um, however, I'm technically not a professional, so, you know, if you have any questions, um, please consult professional resources um, if you're concerned about food safety or unusual ingredients. Um, and I'll give you some links at the end of the presentation uh, for, you know, food safety stuff and a bunch of recipe ideas. Okay, so a quick overview. Um, I'll just go a little bit through um, why, you know, I like to focus on identity through food. Some super basic food and kitchen safety stuff. Uh, cooking basics, common meat alternatives, and some fun demos. Uh, then give you some few resources and we should have some time at the end for a question and answer session. Okay, so feeding your identity through food. Why food? Uh, why do why do I want to focus on identity through recipes and cooking it's, and etc.? Well, everyone eats, <laughs> at least you should be. Um, it's, you know, cultural, so whether that is, you know, cultural, uh, your earth culture, um, if you're, you have some sort of extraterrestrial identity or um, identity that doesn't deal with human, I human cultures, um, you know, that can also play a part as well. Um, there's also a ton of options. Cuisines vary so much and, you know, we can, it's, it's a great way to experiment uh, and share that fun and experimentation with others. Um, it's a lot cheaper usually than gear. So, you know, if you're buying things that uh, make you feel closer to your heart type or kin type or whatever it might be, um, cooking is, is an easy and cheap way to do it generally. And it's a really good skill to practice. Uh, knowing how to cook things uh, well for yourself, uh, well for your family and friends, um, that's a really good skill to have because it keeps you healthy, um, it keeps your friends and family happy, and uh, bringing people a tray of cookies every once in a while uh, is definitely a way to get them to like you. Okay, so you probably have noticed that we're focusing on meat alternatives for, for this panel. Um, in the past, I've done um, some, you know, different panels, uh, draconic dishes, um, safe alternatives for um, alter human food requests, things like that. Um, but here, you know, like I said, we're focusing on fake meat or meat alternatives. So as you can see here on the slide, um, there are a, num a growing number of ve ve vegetarians and vegans. Um, and as a result, you know, with the alter human community, um, with this growing number of vegetarians and vegans, we're going to have more members of the community who are also vegetarian and vegan. So this pertains to a lot of us. And, you know, people are vegetarian and vegan for a number of reasons. Personal health, uh, to help combat climate change, um, because we do know that um, for the most part, eating meat and animal products is not as, as great for the environment. Uh, there's a lot of greenhouse gas emissions associated with it. Um, animal animal wear, excuse me, animal welfare is another uh, part of it, or religious or cultural reasons. You know, there are a lot of um, religions and cultures that do not eat meat or, you know, 
do not partake in certain kinds of animal products. Um, and I, um, you know, through Discord, on Tumblr, you know, other alter human communities, I've heard a number of vegetarian dragons um, or those with dragon-related identities. Um, say that they miss eating meat a lot, uh, but they aren't willing to, go, willing to go back to a diet that contains meat. Uh, also, there are a ton of options. Um, I, as um, you know, I sort of explored my vegetarian um, identity. Um, I really was amazed at how many different dishes there are that were number one delicious, number two good for you, um, and number two, number three, you know, it's not just eating tofu all the time. So it's actually a really, really fun um, thing to take part in. Um, and I will say that not everyone is looking for a meat-like source of protein. Um, so I've, you know, spoken with a number of people who are not not interested in finding fake beef or finding fake chicken. They just want, you know, some kind of protein that makes them happy, and it doesn't necessarily have to mimic animal products. Um, and, you know, to go along with this, things like beans, nuts, dairy, eggs, etc., those are all great vegetarian or vegan sources of protein that don't necessarily mimic meat, and that is awesome. But, for those of us who do crave meat, like myself, um, we are blessed with new vegan and vegetarian-friendly meat replacements coming out constantly, and there are tons of recipes out there um, that uh, provide these awesome meaty meat alternatives. So I'll run through a few of these. Um, like I said, there are a ton out there and they're quite interesting. Um, there's a huge variety and they're all plant or mushroom based. Um, so I'll start off with probably the one we're most familiar with um, that definitely gets a bad rap sometimes. Uh, tofu, or at least soy. Um, tofu is a soy product, so it's made from soybeans. Um, generally, you know, it's these big white cakes probably familiar with it. Um, there's a ton of different kinds of tofu. So there's, you know, what we generally see, um, you know, fried tofu was made from firm tofu. There's silken tofu, um, which you can use to make uh, vegan scrambled eggs um, that if you do it right, they're actually quite good. Um, there's pressed tofu. So you take a block of tofu and you squish it essentially. Um, and uh, that can be, that, that makes it a lot more dense, a lot meatier. Um, and there's also, um, it's, it's called tempeh, it's also a soy product, clearly, um, but it's uh, chunkier, it's got big chunks of soybeans in it, and it's fermented, um, and it can be used to make bacon, um, which is quite tasty. It doesn't have the same texture as normal bacon, but it's quite good. Um, and, you know, some examples, I already mentioned some, but you can also make tofu wings. Um, you know, here's some examples, those tofu wings, scrambled eggs. Uh, up in the left-hand corner is that pressed tofu I mentioned, um, and that picture in the center is the tempeh bacon. So you can see it's kind of nubbly, it's got some texture there. It's, it's really good, honestly. Um, so those are some examples for, of tofu. Um, moving on, this one's... I actually didn't really think very highly of this um, until recently, and I was absolutely blown away, which, uh, spoiler alert, we'll see in one of the demos. Um, this is Satan. It is not Satan. <laughs> Don't call it Satan, people will look at you funny. Um, but it's made from wheat gluten, so unfortunately if you are gluten intolerant, this is not for you. This will make you very sick. Um, but uh, it's accent... It Essentially, um, this is going to sound kind of kind of odd. You'll you'll see later in the demo, um, but it's essentially boiled bread or steamed bread, but uh, because it's wheat gluten, it's um, it maybe tough is not the right word, but it's it's very firm, you, or you can make it very firm, and it mimics meat very very well. Um, it's got a really versatile texture, so you know depending on how it's prepared, it can be you know like I said very firm, or you can um, you know, depending on how you cook it, it can be a little bit lighter. Um, you can actually pull it apart like, um, you know, pulled pork or uh, shredded chicken. Um, the flavor of wheat gluten, gluten itself is not super strong. Um, so that really allows it to absorb flavors well to mimic different meats. So it can, um, you know, be made into things that are that mimic beef, chicken, um, all different kinds of things. Um, some examples here uh, up in the right hand corner. This is a uh, pot roast that is made from uh, se seitan or wheat gluten. 
Um, there's meatballs. Uh, the bottom left hand corner is jerky. Um, I've actually had some and it's quite good. And somebody actually went through the trouble up in the left hand corner, up left, upper left hand corner. Um, somebody made pastrami <laughs> and I've never made it, but um, I'll link uh, that recipe in, in the chat at some point. Um, it's, you know, it's, it really mimics meat well. Um, next, uh, nuts and beans. That's, this is a classic, um, lentils, beans, walnuts, cashews, basically any, any sort of nut, um, or peanut, tree nut, um, those, those kinds of things are really good, um, can be really good meat alternatives. Uh, I'm sure you all have heard of black bean burgers or lentil burgers. Um, another thing is uh, walnut and lentil meatloaf or shepherd's pie. You can make um, you know something that mimics ground meat pretty easily. Um, or while this is not a meat, uh, cashew cheese is a good example. Um, that cashew cheese, it's a cheese spread. You can see there's an image in the middle of that. Um, it actually tastes pretty similar to cheese if, if you make it right. Um, typically people will add nutritional yeast to it. So that'll, that makes it kind of cheesy flavored. Um, shepherd's pie up in the left, uh, upper left hand corner and that, uh, lentil meatloaf I mentioned over on the right. So another one that, um, I have found kind of interesting is mushrooms. And so you'll, you'll notice I haven't mentioned seafood at all here. Um, however, mushrooms are one of those weird exceptions where um, you can, or the, a lot of them have similar flavors to seafood, whether that's scallops, um, there's lobster mushrooms, uh, which are these really interesting bright orange, you know, kind of lobster colored mushrooms, and they taste similar to lobster. Um, and you know, portobello burgers, those are a great example that is pretty common now, um, at least in the, in the US. Um, so down there in the middle, portobello burger, super easy. You know, you just grill a portobello mushroom. Um, you can marinate it um, and it, you know, as it cooks down, it mimics that meaty texture and you can literally just slap it on a bun with some condiments and you have a burger. Um, then there's also those uh, oyster mushroom scallops uh, over on the left. Uh, essentially, you take um, you know the stem of an oyster mushroom, slice it, saute it in you know butter, oil, whatever um, you're you're into using, um, and they taste a little bit like seafood, a little bit like scallops. So it's a pretty delicate texture, but it can mimic scallops enough to sort of satisfy that urge to eat eat scallops and eat seafood. Um, and then over there on the right is that, um, those lobster mushrooms I was talking about, um, they're just cooked with some, some vegetables. Um, and of course, moving on to meat alternatives, commercial products. Um, you know, like I mentioned before, we have been blessed with all different kinds of meatless meats coming out constantly. You know, it's a huge market now. Um, and most of these are made from, you know, some sort of plant or mushroom, um, of various kinds. So soy protein, pea protein, rice and potato starch, wheat gluten, um, like I mentioned earlier with the seitan, um, mushroom protein, etc. Um, you know, there's a really diverse, um, ingredients list here and, um, many mimic real meat quite well. Uh, you know, if you're familiar with Beyond Burgers, uh, Impossible Burgers, some of those are almost uh, indistinguishable if you're not really paying attention to uh, beef patties. Um, and now we have seafood. Um, we have these these uh, fake seafood alternatives that I've never had them, so I can't speak to how good they are, but you know, we have shrimp, we have scallops, we have uh, crab cakes. Um, however, a lot of these are pretty highly processed and do contain significant amounts significant amounts of sodium. So if you're watching your salt intake, um, that's always something to keep in mind. Um, and you know, a lot of them do have, um, preservatives and other things like that. So if you're trying to stay away from that stuff, um, you know, these commercial products are probably not what you're looking for. Um, just a few examples here. Um, I've, I've actually never had any of these. Um, I just kind of pulled these off the internet, but, uh, I've had Beyond Burgers. I think they're delicious. 
Um, but like I mentioned that the seafood, um, there's coconut shrimp you can buy, um, tuna, which is tuna without the tuna, um, and fake and bacon. Uh, you can see there it's made of seitan. Um, but like I said, you know, super versatile and thing, you know, they're coming out constantly with these new products that mimic meat really, really well. So if you're craving something and you're, you know, willing to um, eat something processed, this is a great option. So, you know, why not just buy meat replacements like I was, you know, uh, talking about earlier. Uh, honestly, for me, at least, you know, I really like cooking, so it's a lot more fun for me to make my own. Um, you know, it's this exciting project to work on in the kitchen and maybe fail sometimes, but it's, you know, when it turns out, it's really, really exciting. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, a lot of these meat replacements replacements are highly processed um, and making your own allows you to control what's going into your food so um, you know if you don't want to eat a lot of salt which I really try not to it's not great for you um, or if you're sensitive to things you know like raw garlic or you know gluten or soy or you know anything like that um, you can omit those uh, because you're in complete control so I'll go super briefly over some food safety stuff and, you know, how to, uh, you know, basically av avoid foods, um, or avoid making yourself sick, avoid foods that are going to make you sick. Um, I won't get into this um, super in depth. I did um, in my previous presentations, which I'll also link, um, I do go through that pretty in depth. So, you know, I feel like I'm sort of repeating myself over and over again. So if you'd like to learn more, um, you know, go check those out. But I, I'll just go over it briefly here. Um, first of all, cook your food. Um, <laughs> there are some foods that are harmful to eat raw. And, you know, some of us are monsters here, but don't be a monster when it comes to uh, not cooking your food properly. Um, so there are a lot of, um, er, well, a lot of times we think of meat as being, you know, these uh, high... Um, bacteria or high, you know, um, contaminated foods. But, um, you know, there are definitely vegetarian and vegan foods that uh, can contain bacteria, parasites, or toxic compounds if they're not cooked correctly. And I'll go through a few examples. Um, but uh, proper cooking temperatures neutralize these. Uh, if they didn't, we wouldn't be eating them. Um, and uh, sort of in that same vein, um, a great kitchen tool to get used to using is a kitchen thermometer. So, you know, a lot of people use these um, for, you know, cooking roasts or cooking burgers, steaks, things like that. But it's really useful for cooking uh, vegan and vegetarian uh, items as well, just to make sure that you're cooking them properly. So a few foods to avoid. Um, like I said, you know, meat is one, uh, but we're not dealing with meat in this panel, so I'll you know, sort of leave that off the list. Um, eggs, eggs are vegetarian because they're not a meat product. Um, so, you know, making sure you're cooking your eggs properly. Um, there's always going to be a risk of uh, sal salmonella with um, consuming eggs that aren't completely cooked. Um, you know, if, you, if you have a runny yolk, you know, you're taking um, some risk there, but it's pretty uncommon. Um, but keep in mind, um, also, don't eat raw beans. Not that we're necessarily going to be eating raw beans, but um, I actually didn't realize this until, you know, fairly recently, but, you know, eating undercooked beans, undercooked lentils, um, undercooked lima beans, uh, especially kidney beans. Um, they have um, some toxins, uh, lectin, linamarin, uh, a few things like that, that can actually make you really sick. So, um, you know, you don't have to be super, super worried about it, but make sure you're cooking your beans well. Um, and then flour. Um, so uh, one of the reasons why people say not to eat raw cookie dough is not because of the eggs. Uh, if you leave the eggs out, um, the cookie dough is still not safe to eat. It's the flour. Um, flour can contain, uh, I believe it's E. coli. Um, don't fact check me, or <laughs> I could be wrong there. Um, but, uh, you know, some contaminant uh, pathogen that can make you really sick. Um, so yeah, cook your, cook your raw cookie dough and, you know, make some nice baked cookies instead. Uh, some basic food prep, um, you know, before we actually get into the demos where I will be showing you recipes, um, I will walk you through how to actually follow a recipe, uh, because I will be, um, showing the recipes, um, on some slides pre prior to the actual demos. Um, 
if you never followed a recipe before, if you're not familiar with, uh, you know, anything in the kitchen, which is totally fine. Um, you know, we all got to start somewhere if you're interested in learning more about cooking. Um, but basically following a recipe, um, ingredients should be, um, if it's a well-written recipe, should be listed in the order of use. Um, they're always listed with, you know, the amounts that you should be measuring. Um, a good tip is to prep ingredients before you start cooking, uh, because, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've started cooking something and then realized I didn't prep half the ingredients and then something's burning while I'm chopping and it's just, you know, kind of a nightmare. So save yourself some trouble and, you know, chop your vegetables, measure your flour, thaw your, thaw your frozen ingredients, etc. Uh, before you turn on the burner uh, or turn on the oven. And, um, you know, another big thing, make sure your oven, um, it, or if it calls for your oven to be preheated, make sure you actually do that. Um, some ovens take a while to preheat and they will say that they're preheated uh, completely to you know whatever temperature you tell them to be but they're actually not quite there yet um, so let your oven uh, get to its proper temperature um, and I mentioned this before but you know each ingredient is listed with a measurement um, however if it's if it's listed with to taste um, just use the amount that tastes good to you um, it's really you know chef's uh, preference and a dash or a pinch implies a small amount of, you know, whatever that ingredient is. Um, also, if you want an applesauce cake recipe, this is my family applesauce cake recipe, so feel free to steal it. Uh, a few more tips. Um, read your recipe once before uh, you, you actually start beginning. Um, and know your measurements, uh, especially tablespoon versus teaspoon. Oh my goodness, <laughs> you can really ruin a recipe. If you put in a tablespoon of salt versus a teaspoon, you are going to notice and it will be inedible, I promise you. Um, also for weight measurements like ounces and grams, a kitchen scale is a lifesaver. And I actually prefer to do most of my cooking uh, measuring things out with my kitchen scale instead of using a measuring cup. Um, and then finally, um, you know, practice makes perfect. If you don't, uh, or if, you, if your dish doesn't look like the photograph, you know, don't worry. I've made plenty of fugly dishes in my life. <laughs> I've burned things, I've dropped things, things have fallen, you know, it's just, don't worry about it. As long as somebody enjoys eating it, you know, you've done well somehow. So with that, uh, let's move on to our first demo. Um, so the first demo we're, we're going to do, um, well, let me preface this with all these recipes are vegan. Um, you know, this is focusing on vegan and vegetarian dishes, um, but I figured I'd go with the lowest common denominator and just do all vegan dishes. So if you want to add something that is an animal product but not meat, you are welcome to. Then it becomes vegetarian, not vegan. Um, but uh, this is most accessible to everyone. So we're going to start with vegan ground beef. Um, I've given this a rating of difficulty rating of two out of five. Um, basically that means it's pretty easy. Um, you know, it does involve some chopping. Um, you know, if you're not good with a knife, that might be a little bit difficult for you. Um, but it's, it's pretty darn easy. Uh, so a little bit about the dish before we get started. Um, uh, this is super versatile. Uh, the, if the recipe calls for ground beef, um, there's a pretty good chance you can use this in its place. And we'll be making a taco meat version here, but the spices can be swapped out to make all kinds of other dishes, whether that's, you know, Italian sausage flavored, uh, Indian samosa filling, uh, Korean bibimbap, um, you know, just whatever. Um, basically, if you can add spices to it, um, you can make this ground beef taste like pretty much anything normal ground beef would be in. Uh, however, this is not safe for nut allergies. This has a lot of walnuts in it. Uh, so if you are sensitive to walnuts, do not make this. <laughs> um, and this recipe, it's, it doesn't quite follow the recipe perfectly um, from this link, but it's adapted from it, so it's pretty darn close. Um, if you do want to make this on your own, some equipment you'll need is a chef's knife and cutting board. So big, a chef's knife is that you know big chopping knife that uh, you see chefs with. Uh, measuring spoons, measuring cup, a nonstick pan or similar, uh, a spatula, and to make your life easier, if you have a food processor, I highly recommend using it, which I will show you in a little bit why I say that. Um, here's the recipe. 
Um, again, I will link this uh, in the chat, um, so don't worry about trying to screenshot this or reading you know, through all of this um, now, unless you really want to. Um, but basically we'll be using walnuts, mushrooms, soy sauce. Um, if you're not um, you know, consuming soy for any reason, you can use coconut aminos. I've never had them, but they're pretty similar to soy sauce as far as I'm aware. Uh, ketchup cumin, which is a spice, um, smoked paprika, onion powder, and garlic powder. Um, I've actually omitted the salt in this. Um, I mentioned earlier I'm trying not to eat a lot of salt just because, you know, it's not great for you. But uh, you can add it if you want. Um, and then finally, olive oil. And we'll just be chopping up all of the ingredients um, and basically sauteing them. So uh, we will start off. So chopping the garlic first, you know, pretty simple and <laughs> nothing fancy there. Uh, moving on to the mushrooms, I'm slicing them in half. Um, I've already brushed these off so they're clean, uh, but you know, it's a lot of mushrooms to chop. You can see why I recommend uh, using a food processor if you have one. Um, so we want these fairly fine. You want them to be ground beef textured. You don't want giant chunks of mushroom in your, your ground, fake ground beef. So chop, chop, chop. Uh, we're done with those. Move the garlic too. Moving on to the walnuts. This took forever. I was very tired of chopping walnuts by the end of this. So again, you can see why I recommend using a food processor if you have one. Um, we want these to be fairly fine, you know, ground beef textured, like I mentioned. We don't want giant walnut chunks, but we also don't want these to be, uh, you know, a fine walnut dust. So, you know, if, you, if you've had ground beef before, you can kind of gauge it by that. So we're finally done chopping. We'll heat up some oil in the pan. Oh, there's my cat. She says hi. <laughs> uh, looks like that's done. So we'll add the walnuts and the mushrooms and the spices and let it cook for a little bit. Um, it'll cook out most of the liquid from those mushrooms. Um, once it's starting to brown, we'll add in the soy sauce and the tomato or the uh, ketchup. Stir that. Uh, add a little bit of olive oil. Um, so this is the finished product. It you know really didn't take that long to cook, um, and you can see it's a little bit oily, like ground beef tends to be. So that's realistic. Uh, it also looks like ground beef, and it really tastes like taco meat. I mean, obviously you have the walnut bits in there. Um, and so it's not the exact texture of ground beef, but uh, it's really delicious. Um, I didn't use it for tacos. I just had it with some you know, vegetables and, and whatnot throughout the week. But um, boy, was it good. Highly recommend. For our next uh, demo, um, I'll be showing you rice paper bacon. Um, this one was, I, I rated it a three out of five for difficulty just because it's kind of finicky um, and the recipe seems really easy, um, but cooking the bacon turned out to be a little bit harder than I expected, and uh, yeah, um, it required some trial and error essentially, um, as far as trying to get you know the right amount of marinade, uh, etc., on it. Um, also, this was really good. It's really salty. It's really you know savory, umami. You know that that delicious kind of satisfying flavor, but it wasn't really bacony. Um, and in part that might be because uh, I didn't have, um, so uh, liquid, it's called liquid smoke. It's basically smoke flavoring. Um, and instead I used barbecue sauce, um, which they recommend if you don't have that. So adding that liquid smoke flavor may have changed the um, bacon-iness of it. Um, but my suggestion is if you want vegan bacon or vegetarian bacon that actually tastes like bacon, um, you might just, you know, want to buy the commercial stuff. Um, but that's, you know, not to say that this wasn't awesome and, you know, you should totally make it regardless. Uh, this is where I got the recipe. Um, again, I used a few different things, um, so I adapted it a little bit. Um, but, uh, if you feel like making it, um, this is the equipment you'll need. Uh, kitchen shears, uh, parchment paper, or a silicone baking mat. I just use parchment paper, but uh, silicone baking mats are awesome. Uh, I don't have one yet, but someday. Uh, a bowl or a casserole dish to dip your bacon slices in. A uh, whisk or a fork and a cookie sheet to actually bake everything on. Here's the recipe. Uh, so it does use rice paper. Um, so this isn't a very high protein um, meat replacement, but it's a tasty meat replacement. Um, 
And uh, yeah, so it uses a nutritional yeast, garlic powder, olive oil, um, soy sauce or tamari, which is, is similar to soy sauce. Uh, liquid smoke, like I mentioned, I just, just use barbecue sauce, but if you want it to be more bacony, I would say, you know, spring for liquid smoke. Uh, I just realized that I have a typo on my recipe. Uh, don't use double the liquid smoke. <laughs> um, a tablespoon of maple syrup uh, for a little bit of sweetness. Black pepper, paprika, and then mushroom seasoning or MSG, which is monosodium glutamate. Gets a bad rap, but it's delicious. Um, here I've used mushroom seasoning. Um, basically what you do is you uh, dip these rice paper slices um, into your marinade that you've, you know, you've made, uh, and then you bake them until they're crispy. Um, and they do crisp up really fast, so you know, just be aware of that. Keep an eye on them. Don't forget about them. So, uh, here I'm just mixing all the spices together in the, uh, maple syrup and whatnot. Um, I used, uh, Trader Joe's Mushroom and Company seasoning, which I, I, th my marinade is really dark and I think that's why. Uh, here I'm just cutting the rice paper into strips, bacon -y strips. Um, this is where I had a little bit of trouble. You can see I have a lot of marinade on there. It's tough to get off, so I kind of sponged it off and it didn't really work. So this is, uh, try number two coming up here where I kind of squeegee everything off the chopsticks and it worked a little bit better. Um, you can see everything came out pretty dark, but it's it's really good. It, it turned out really tasty. It's just uh, not super bacony. Um, Here's some, some of the finished products. Uh, you can see they, it's pretty crispy, um, like uh, well done bacon, like really good, uh, but just not super bacony. Uh, yeah. So moving on to the last recipe, the last demo I'll show you. Uh, this, I was blown away at how good this was. Um, honestly, I think I like this better than normal chicken. Um, I will, however, give this a rating of difficulty rating of four out of five. Um, it involves a lot of steps. Well, I guess not necessarily a lot of steps, but it does involve some equipment. Um, if you don't have the equipment for it, it's kind of a bother. Uh, and um, you know, it's it involves uh, boiling or steaming. It involves cooking, cutting, uh, some kneading potentially. You have to tie stuff in a knot. It's a, I'll show you, essentially. <laughs> um, so this is uh, Satan, not Satan, by the way. Um, so, you know, I mentioned earlier that, that this stuff is super versatile and it really is. Um, and so here we're making a chicken version. Um, the chicken absorbs flavors really well, so it's good for saucy dishes. Um, you know, if you, you can add it to soups, you can add it to stir fries with, you know, teriyaki sauce, whatever you want. Um, you know, you can, you can actually saute it and it browns up really nice like chicken. Um, uh, you can also bread it and fry it, um, really whatever you want, um, put in tacos. Um, uh, like I mentioned earlier, um, uh, seitan is, uh, made with vital wheat gluten. Um, so it's not safe for anyone allergic or sensitive to gluten. Um, unfortunately, so if you have Crohn's disease or celiac disease or any sort of gluten intolerance, don't make this, please. <laughs> um, but there's the recipe is adapted from that link there. Um, and again, I will link this in the chat. As far as equipment goes, um, you need a chef's knife and cutting board, a pot or a saucepan that you can cook the uh, seitan in, uh, tongs or slotted spoon. Uh, thermometer is good to have. You don't need it. Um, we'll be cooking this long enough that it will be cooked all the way through, but it's nice to have. And um, if you do have a food processor, I highly suggest using it. Uh, but if you don't, it's still totally doable. Uh, so for this, um, uh, it does involve chickpeas. So it's not just straight wheat gluten. Um, so the chickpeas give it a little bit more flavor. Um, vegetable broth. Uh, if you do, like I said, um, you know, it, it absorbs flavors really well, especially, you know, depending on what, what you make it with. So if you have a chicken style vegetable broth, uh, I highly recommend using that. Um, olive oil, lemon juice, soy sauce, garlic, um, and then wheat gluten. Um, you can buy this online. You can get this in health food stores. It's actually pretty readily available, um, a lot more so than I expected. Uh, nutritional yeast. Um, also pretty readily available, and then um, a bunch of different uh, spices uh, and herbs. 
So um, here, um, I'm just listed, you know, how I did this in a food processor, uh, but you can chop everything by hand um, and then knead it, um, which is a lot more work, uh, but it's still definitely doable without this equipment. Um, so essentially you're just blending the chickpeas and then you add the wheat gluten and all of your seasonings. Um, if you do use a, a food processor, make sure you're not just running it and running it and running it. Um, that'll wear out your motor because this stuff is thick. Um, so yeah, you want to pause the food processor every 30 seconds or so to let the motor uh, have a break and to make sure you're not like way overdoing your dough. Um, and then you just want to make sure you're steaming it or boiling it until the internal temperature reaches around 190 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and there are, uh, way back when I was, you know, talking about different kinds of meat alternatives, um, I did mention that seitan, um, is, can be cooked in a number of different ways and will, you know, have different textures depending on how you cook it. In this recipe, I boil it, um, and that gives it a little bit more of a, I guess, a uh, lighter, um, you know, it's not super dense texture, um, and more of a, you know, shredded chicken texture. Uh, but you can, you can uh, wrap it up um, or you can compress it um, as it's cooking to make these denser, um, you know, steak or chicken breast type uh, meat, meat replacements. Um, or you can steam it, um, you know, if you're, if you don't want to boil it, um, which does make it puff up a little bit, uh, you can just straight up steam it, um, whether you wrap it or not, that'll help it be a little bit less spongy. Um, so with that, let's uh, see how this works. So here I'm adding the chickpeas and a couple cloves of garlic uh, and the spices, just uh, blending those and then adding some of the liquid ingredients. Uh, and then the broth, that's no chicken flavored broth. And then that's the wheat gluten, it looks like flour. Um, here I'm mixing it, you can see I'm cleaning up a little bit, you know, never a bad idea. Uh, I have the broth heating up over on the left that we're going to cook it in, and you can see I'm giving the motor on the food processor a rest. Um, this is dough. It's essentially dough. You can see I'm stretching it, and I'm actually tying it in a knot so it has more of a pulled uh, chicken, shredded chicken uh, texture. And we let it cook for about 50 minutes. Looks like it's good temperature. I'm going to drain it and then let it cool off a little bit. Uh, this is the finished product. It's chickeny. It, it's, you know, kind of stretchy a little bit. I mean, chicken isn't really like that, but it, you can shred it, you make a you know, nugget chunks out of it. Um, here's a better close-up. You can see it's got that chickeny texture, uh, shredded chicken. It looks like chicken. It's the same color. Uh, and then here I've sauteed it with some vegetables and some sauce. Um, you know, like I mentioned before, it uh, holds on to that sauce flavor really well, so you can flavor it with anything. Um, and you can also see like it's got that shredded chicken texture, but if you wrap it while you steam it or boil it um, You can actually give it this, you know, chicken breast or steak here, you know, that dense texture um, But holy cow, it's so good. Um, I, I never expected it to be um, As good as it was so um, highly recommend it's really not that hard especially like I said if you have a food processor um, so that concludes the demos. Um, I'll give you a few resources here. I, I always like to rep a few things. Um, first of all, I know this is, again, US-centric. Uh, I apologize. I am most familiar with US resources. Um, so, you know, obviously, uh, foodsafety.gov, that's our, you know, government food safety site. So what's there is well vetted. Um, if you have any food safety concerns or, you know, questions, this is a good place to search first. Um, I've mentioned this in all of my presentations, but I really like this website. It's called Taste Atlas. Um, here's a, a good example, uh, if I can get the video to play. Um, it's, it has a map. You can just scroll around and zoom into different places. Um, and it lists all of these different, uh, cuisines, dishes from all over the world. Uh, and so you can actually zoom in, you know, here we're zooming into Japan. Um, so say you're, you're feeling like you want some, some ramen or you want some dumplings or gyoza, what have you, um, you can, uh, just go search for, for all of these different things. And, um, if you're interested in a different or in a certain, uh, place, you know, in the world, 
um, you can explore it through food. So as I was mentioning earlier with uh, cultural cuisines and, you know, how to share uh, experiences with other people or how to, you know, get closer to your identity if you have an earth-based identity, this is a great way to do it. Um, and they have a lot of interesting dishes that, um, you know, I guess there, there are certain dishes, you know, associated with Italy, like pizza and lasagna or whatever, but you can zoom into certain places and actually get a feel for what somebody from that certain region would eat or what have you. So, you know, I really, really, really like it. Um, can't say, uh, can't say enough about it, honestly. Um, I also. I also uh, really like to rep kin food. Um, so this is an, well, primarily um, other kin or other kind uh, tumbler, um, but you know, it really will work for you know any elder human or non-human identity. Um, however, it you know it's basically a dead tumbler. Um, I actually haven't checked it recently, um, but you know they they may have added a few more things. Hopefully, uh, every once in a while I'll get a little burst of activity. Uh, but essentially, that, um, you can search it for, you know, whatever your identity is. You can you know look for birds, and then you know if you have a bird identity or you know something that you you know you you want to look up something that has to do with birds um, or you know dwarves or you know whatever. Um, this is a great place to find, um, you know, these uh, alter human identity related recipes. Um, and they have, you know, all kinds of fun stuff. Um, however, the tag system doesn't work anymore, um, so you have to, you know, add things in manually. Um, but, like I said, it's still worth exploring. It's, it's a really cool tumbler. Um, and then, uh, finally, um, this, is, this is one I just found recently. Um, vegan and vegetarian protein overview. Um, this is from Healthline, so um, they generally have uh, pretty good stuff if it's um, fact-checked. Um, so it just gives you an overview of, you know, if you are looking to go vegan or vegetarian, or if you already are and you're looking for sources of protein, um, this is a good overview, a good place to learn about it. And um, again, I will link this in the chat so uh, you have links that you can click instead of trying to type in everything here on this slide because I know it doesn't provide links. <laughs> um, so uh, with that I, um, I'm i done. I really appreciate you listening. Um, thanks so much for tuning in. Um, if you have any questions that you don't think of until later um, or you, know, you don't want to ask in the chat or whatever you can always email me. Um, you can uh, shoot me a, a DM um, here on Discord uh, or go find me on Tumblr, um, or check out my website, beyondhumanity.net. I'm, I mean, it's not a great way to get in contact with me, but you can see what I'm up to, because uh, I do update the blog every once in a while. That's kind of all I've done recently, unfortunately. But anyway, um, we should have some time for a question and answer session. Um, so if any of you have questions about what I showed you, um, some thoughts about things you would like to, you know, learn more about or you know you have some recipe ideas things that have worked well for your identity uh let's go for it please share um you know share your thoughts with me uh, and again thank you so much and i hope you enjoyed this